my name is Allison Rowe. Um, this is Monday, August 2011, and I am at the Utah Valley University George Sutherland Archives in Orem, Utah, interviewing Jill Durr. For the purposes of the Utah Women's Walk, today we are going to talk about uh, Sister, Durr's, Sister Durr's life and her contributions to life in the state of Utah. Can I call you Sister Durr? Oh, certainly, yes. Okay. If there's something else you prefer, then please don't feel me. <laughs> and I really appreciate this opportunity. Thank you. Well, let's begin. Where were you born? And um, where did you attend school? I was born in Salt Lake City at the Holy Cross Hospital. I grew up, uh, my early years were uh, on Judith Street in Salt Lake City, 2910 Judith Street. My parents are William Arnold Mulbank, who always went by Bill, and uh, my mother is Ruth Carol Brinton Mulvey. Um, my father was in the Navy and, uh, and during World War II, and my, my mother uh, spent time together in the, the Midwest where he was serving. He never did go abroad. Uh, they came home and settled in Salt Lake, and he worked for a while for the telephone to be independent. So he, he had a grocery store for most of my my. And my mother was um, a full-time mom, and uh, we have four children in our family. I have an older sister, Joellen, who was 15 months older, and a younger sister, Jan, who was three years younger, and a younger brother, Scott, who was five years younger than I. So, um, it was a happy, happy growing up. I went to uh, elementary school at Nibley Park and Holiday. We moved from Judith Street to Holiday when I was about five. And so uh, really my whole growing up until, almost until I was married was in, in Holiday. Went to Olympus Junior High School and Olympus High, and then went to the University of Utah, which I, I loved. Um, I and uh, I loved the U. It was, it was a, a wonderful experience for me. I was in a sorority, Chi Omega, and uh, had just loved being able to be on campus. Once I, I didn't move away from home, but I might as well have because I spent full time on, on campus and loved that. That's wonderful. Thank you. Is there anything else that you would like to share about your family life? You mentioned two younger siblings. Older, so you're the second. Uh huh. Is there anything else you'd like to share about your family? Uh, you know, as as I've grown older, I I've realized I think more and more what a, a very happy family I had. A very happy family life. Not that we didn't have our ups and downs. Uh, there is a lot of love and support in my family. A lot of getting together of the extended family. My mother's uh, mother died when she was quite young. I mean, she was just a young mother. I think I was probably just four or five. And uh, but my mother had uh, who had no children, and so they they provided us a lot of nurturance and love, as well as my mother's sisters. And our uh, our family, especially after we moved to Holiday, where we lived on on Willow Road, we. We had the the neighborhood was really an extended family and community. I formed a lot of close relationships there. My parents uh, were not Latter Day Saints. Actually, my my father was a Latter Day Saint, but he hadn't been in the Navy. And my mother was not a Latter Day Saint. In fact, came from a Mormon family. But uh, we had a a very convivial neighborhood with lots of neighborhood activities, a big Christmas tree where we gathered around and this time and um, we made little we made little cars. We lived on kind of a hill and kids made their own little cars and we ran down the hill. Uh, and my 
my uh, parents, I think the biggest value in our family was choice. And so, uh, we asked if we could go to the LDS primary meetings. They were very supportive of that, mutual, and and even supported all their baptized and as as Latter Day Saints. And uh, so that was. It was a rich and happy time. My dad worked long hours. He worked 12 hour days from 9 in the morning till 9 at night. I remember him as a, a presence in the family, a very affectionate and loving man. Taught to work hard. Uh, but I, as I say, choice in our family was really uh, an important value. And uh, much to my husband's chagrin sometimes. But um, that and choice were central, central values and service. My, my, my parents were very charitable. Through his grocery, um, donated a lot to the building of our, our new chapel in Holiday. Uh, my, my mother was always taking food to neighbors and another very important value in our family. You've spoken very about your family. Is there a particular story, though, uh, an experience? Um, you mentioned some kind of, but is there a particular memory that you remember that you have that is very significant to you that maybe displays feelings? Uh, oh, there would be there would be many. Uh, two, two I'll mention um, that uh, that have to do with my parents that still make me tear up a little bit. Um, and they really, when I was then I was when I was older, but I think they uh, they would suggest a couple of things that were important to me. Uh, when I graduated from high school, my one of my closest friends went to Harvard, and. Uh, that was a, it was a hard time financially in my family and I thought of going away to school. You know, my dad just said, that's just, there's no way that will be possible. But the first uh, Thanksgiving she was gone, um, I went to California to meet her and uh, spend Thanksgiving with her. And I, I, I was flying standby and my parents dropped me off at, off at the airport and I mean, I but I hadn't had any, hadn't had much experience away from home, and I, I still remember them to, to tell them that I had, I hadn't been able to get on the first flight, and I had to wait at the airport, and it just seemed like ten minutes later I turned around and my dad was there, and he'd come to take me, give me some, feed me some dinner, and take care of me until the next. That was, that was really sweet. Um, my. Uh, sewed everything, and uh, you know it was an era when mom sewed. I don't think they do as much now. Cheaper store store bought, but uh, after I graduated from college and was ready to go to, I'd made this decision to go to um, the Harvard Graduate School of Education. I sent, spent that um, spring sewing for me. I had. You know, I had four or five dresses that without the fabric and the patterns, and uh, my mother sewed my wardrobe to go to graduate school. And I I realize now, I mean, I, th I think it's a big deal to have pants for my grandchild. <laughs> so I, I realize what a loving act that was, and I uh, greatly appreciate it. Um, and you mentioned your your so mm -hmm. your your mom's aunts or your mom's yeah your mom's aunts really having a lot of involvement and playing a big role in your life. Um, who were the women that you admired growing up? And if you want to mention your aunts, how 
how did they influence you specifically or mm-hmm. any other women as well? Uh, there have been so many good women in my life. Uh, let me get, let me, well, I will talk about my aunts first. Um, Field Recor and Josie Renders or Josie Maxfield Renders. Uh, they lived in in Sugar House. Uh, they both uh, married late. Grandmother's sisters. She died young. They they loved taking care of her her five five daughters. I mean, they really took them in. As they they had um, uh, they homesteaded together in Nevada. They, I, they went with their husbands to Nevada and homesteaded, and they set up a lodge up Big Cottonwood Canyon where the Maxfields had had property and made sure, sure that their nieces got property and we still have a cabin on that property. Um, they're very generous. Uh, they worked very hard running the Maxfield Lodge there and I remember going there a lot as a little girl. I know they uh, they did all right. My, my parents talk about um, how hard it was when they first got married and they always Dad says, I don't know what I would have done without without the ants. They were the ants, and it's always went up there for Sunday dinner, and they gave my dad a loan to set up his own grocery store, and uh, we spent a lot of a lot of time at their their house. Uh, I remember actually in 1977, just before I got married, my parents had moved from our home in Holiday, and uh, I my I, my roommate were closing down the our apartment because they had all they had all uh, recently married and so I had a couple of months and I moved in with Aunt Lois and Aunt Jo who were in their 80s or something and they you know they made breakfast for me every morning I think I was always they had their their what they called Cambridge tea which was hot water with even that was their morning drink <laughs> um, you know, they were they were bottlers, canners, jam. They made wonderful uh, cookies, and they just fussed. I, that was what a great way to be a bride. I mean, they just fussed over me every day as I as I prepared for my my wedding. Um, they they were uh, my mother's family. Her father, especially, was anti Mormon. They were they were very friendly toward uh, Latter Day Saints and. Elder Faust, Jim Faust had been their attorney, and they could never say enough good about uh, Jim Faust. And all you know, to the end of their lives, he came and visited them. Uh, they were they were just great people. My aunt Jo left me her diaries. Um, all, uh, um, just uh, I, I just loved them. I, they were strong women. They were working women. They'd always worked, and uh, so I think that was an important. Another person I I really loved was uh, the mother of my good friend, Chris Garf, and this was uh, Faye Ross Kelly Garf in Holiday. And uh, I think my mom was was more uh, practical, and uh, the Garfs were were a little uh, their home was a little more elegant, and uh, so I was fa- I, I think I was fascinated by that elegant. The fact that Faye always had placemats on her table when we sat down <coughs> for a meal of any kind, um, and she was so gracious. She had such a great sense of humor. She was president uh, for a while. I remember her going to camp. Elegant Faye, who later worked at ZCMI in elegant dresses, with um, yeah, that was just it was just really fun for me. I uh, Faye Garf and. Uh, Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, this is mother of my other friend. I'm sure it will come to me in a minute. Um, we had a great ward. Lucille Barnes was a Maya May teacher in that ward. Uh, I think I think apart from my own mother, I was interested in in the differences. You know, uh, as I say, my mom was a wonderful cook. The aunts were wonderful cooks. Food is a big deal in our family, so. Um, that was it from from them. My mother, a hard worker, beautiful seamstress, 
So I, I, but I was actually looking for other kinds of, of, of models. Another really important was uh, Gwen Anderson, uh, who was uh, the counselor in my high school. And uh, I was girls association school and spent a lot of time with her. Um, she was a funny woman. She was just funny. She had a great sense of humor. She was kind of a back slapping uh, woman and dear to me, just dear. Uh, always dealt with humor, great advisor for girls association and important model. So those are those are some of the the early ones. If you want to hear about later on, or <laughs> um, yeah, I think we can all be pretty good. I, you can talk about them whenever you like, though. So don't. Okay. Um, mm, did you? You mentioned about your aunts kind of fussing over you as you prepared for your for your wedding. Um, what do you have about your courtship and your marriage exactly? Um, could you tell me about that? Yes, um, and would you, would you mind if I back up a little Not first to kind of get a running start? Yeah. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, I uh, left the University of Utah to to go to graduate school. Really, much like women of my generation, I, I anticipated that I would uh, marry of going to college, and uh, that isn't the, the route my life took. And that was a little hard for me my senior year because a lot of women I knew were getting married. Uh, in our sorority, we had a, a what was known as the candle ceremony. You 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 blew out the candle if you got, um, and and so you pass this candle around the circle and and uh, sang a song and people blew it out. Uh, everybody got excited at that. And uh, I just really wanted to have that experience. So after I got accepted to Harvard for their masters in teacher uh, teaching. Um, spent some time in Boston and I got a little Harvard pin and uh, so before I left college I, I blew out the candle <laughs> told them I was now I was now engaged to go to Harvard <laughs> that was that was a little different in my generation uh, at, at least among the women I knew there weren't a lot going to graduate school right right then uh, that was very important to me and I loved I started in the summer right after I, I graduated from the U and went to this master's in teaching program, which was um, summer of, of uh, a training in in uh, a summer school program and then work a subject area and education. So my I continued my subject area as English and then did the work in education. And I, I uh, had taken some History at the U. It was a it was a new topic then in the late '60s, uh, after the Civil Rights Movement, and uh, so I was was really um, teach in a black school. I taught um, I did my student teaching in an all black school, the Martin Luther King Middle, and that was a uh, uh, was a wonderful experience for me. I loved I loved that. And I loved the uh, Latter Day Saint community in Cambridge, especially. I that probably tended to be my my base of operations, and I did mm -hmm. uh, some dating there. But I, I finished graduate school and and two years of teaching in Boston, um, and there still un, unmarried, uh, and started my work at the the church historical department. Um, and still wasn't wasn't married, <laughs> so I, this is when I when I actually get married, I do I should add another uh, another uh, model in here, but maybe I'll do that when we talk about professional uh, career. But I came, to, uh, I returned. I was was actually about four years in Boston and returned in September or the summer of seven uh, after. 
after I'd taught school there for a couple of years and um, got a job at the the historical department, a research assistant job in history. And that was a meaningful, exciting uh, time for me. Uh, of, of people and um, my husband isn't somebody I, I uh, dated for very long. I'd actually known him in Cambridge. He, he was married previously, and I had, had known his wife and his, his children. And uh, in the interim of four or five years, they were divorced. And he kind of looked me up um, after I, I dated someone else seriously and broken up. He, he kind of looked me up. And I do have to say, it was, it, it was just one of, those, one of those things. He called me in the in February of seventy seven and uh, I I just felt immediately that this was very important and uh, we we connected briefly. It was it was actually many months his divorce was final, so we didn't date. We 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 corresponded and uh, talked on the phone, but uh, we didn't date until that summer when his divorce was and then I think it was just one of those things. We just both sort of knew that it was going to be fine and work out. And, uh, and we got married in October of, of 77. Uh, we, he had in, in Alpine that he, uh, where he was interested in building. We decided we would, we would move there. We wouldn't build there. In fact, we decided to sell that property and bought an older home in Alpine spend a lot of time fixing up. We both, we both liked older homes and um, eventually we started off with custody of just his son and eventually um, the other two daughters and, uh, and then we had uh, our youngest son born in 1979. So we had children, um, one born in 68 and one in 71 and one in 73 and then our our son in, in 79. So we, it, it's, it was a challenge pulling um, uh, that kind of family together. We, we had our ups and downs and difficulties, uh, but we survived it. I think one of the great things for our family was, uh, was uh, uh, obtained a, a teaching appointment in France in 1985 and so we took the whole family in and went to France for eight months. Uh, that, was, that was a great experience for us, I think, pulling together apart from some of the other things that had, had nagged at us uh, when we lived in Utah. So that was, that was a really exciting experience. Uh, husband's a great French speaker. He had, he had spoken, um, he had had and here we haven't even said his name. My husband is uh, <laughs> uh, Brooklyn Durr, and uh, he he served mission, and uh, then he studied uh, political science, education, and business. So we actually had known each other at the Harvard at school, even though he was in a different program, and he sort of straddled education and business, and actually taught. In in uh, Fontainebleau, France, and that's where we lived and had a wonderful time in the forests of Fontainebleau and uh, being in Paris and our kids were in bilingual situation. That was, it was really a great time for our family. So. This is a, a question that I prepared, but I hope it was okay. Um, you had mentioned very, very family focused. You see, even very family oriented, even to extended family and so on. As you married someone who had already three children. How did you see your experiences of having a very 
tight-knit family background and your own immediate family help you to um, kind of make that transition to family that had already been started really. Mm -hmm. Does that well, question good, make Yeah, I think that's a good question. I think one of my husband's good questions was, will you, will you love my, my children? Um, I, I had been teaching school, young kids in school, six really young. I felt really attached to a lot of my students. So for me, that was the most immediate experience, and I told him that, that I, I you know, I, I really loved the students I taught, and really, really cried when I left them. Um, so I, it was, it was wonderful for me to take on these children. It was a lot, it was a lot of fun, and I was helped by my extended family. Uh, I, I, uh, my parents just accepted these grandchildren immediately uh, as theirs. They they claimed them and and loved them, and that that did make it. A lot uh, and I I mean I tried to do the things that my mother had done for me to cook and to sew for those when they were they were young. And one of the reasons we decided to move to Alpine after living there a year. We, we had a sense of what a, a wonderfully nurturing community it was, and that was really great hope for us with our uh, children who'd been in a, a very difficult situation. Uh, they just, we, we had a great neighborhood. I think I the kind of neighborhood I'd had, and um, my husband Brooke wanted them to have the kind of growing up he'd had, so we got a horse like he'd had when he was young and a dog uh, but most of all it was the neighbors it was it was those kids our kids being able to run with the the crew in the neighborhood which is the way i'd them to have that and they they had many good friends and um a, a great latter-day saint ward and uh, all of that was 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 wonderful for us still in our same home in alpine i mean we've been there for 34 years now and uh, that is that is home for the the kid with the grandchildren now um, and I think I think you know I think making that home a center of their lives was important to us our two daughters had their we had our wedding reception there we actually we actually um, fixed bought the home we got married spent a month fixing it up and invited all our friends to come to a big open house a month after we were married had their receptions there and it's been a it's been a great center place for us. Oh that was that's really wonderful. So you mentioned um, um, in Utah you're in the holiday area for a while to Harvard for your masters in teaching and then you moved to Alpine where did your where was your professional career? Where is the timeline of your at that point? What did you do when you came to, to Alpine? And again, I'll back up just a little bit. When I was uh, when I was in Cambridge, uh, I was uh, teaching school, and that that had always been my ambition to teach school. Uh, from the U with a, a teaching certificate in English and I did this year of a master's degree in teaching um, so it, it teach school and after I'd been in Boston about three years I I felt like I'd like to return to, to Utah I just felt strongly that I'd like to do that and I came back to Utah looking for a teaching um, but just before I'd left Boston, uh, there were a group of women in Boston who were active uh, in searching out Latter-day Saint women's history. I didn't know that. I mean, they were largely a married group. They, they Bushman and Laura Ulrich, Judy Dushku, and others who put together the, the Pink Dialogue, the summer 1971 issue of Dialogue that looked at uh, Mormon and uh, they actually had, had uh, I guess that was just coming out the summer I uh, started 
well, I just finished my graduate work, I guess, is the summer that came out. I was not really aware of them. Uh, after they published that, they institute in a class in Mormon women's history. They found old copies of the Women's Exponent at Widener Library, and they'd been starting their own research in Mormon women's history. In 1972, Leonard Arrington was named church historian. He had a great interest in forwarding women's history. They were in touch with him and he with them. He hired uh, Maureen B uh, Ersenbach to help on his staff as an editor, but she also had the assignment to do uh, women's history, and she started off researching Eliza R. Snow. So uh, the spring before Boston, the spring of 1973, Maureen Ersenbach uh, came and gave a lecture on Eliza R. Snow of Claudia and Richard Bushman, and uh, I heard that I uh, said to Maureen after, after I introduced myself, you know, where do you find the, where do you find the information? I've never even heard of this woman. Uh, and, and she told me a little bit about what was going on in the historical church at that time. And another friend of mine, uh, Catherine Hansen, now Schertz, uh, happened to get a research fellowship at the historical department. Uh, she also left Boston and, and got a research fellowship at the so I returned to Utah looking for a teaching job and couldn't find one and I sort of thought, well, it would be interesting if I could get a fellowship at the historical department. So I went there and talked to, to she, she uh, hired me. I had this, this three-month fellowship to, to help her locate the poetry of Eliza R. Snow. That was the beginning of that uh, professional work. Uh, it was an the historical department was just barely up and, and going, and uh, I worked with Maureen, and I set up a little card file. I got to look through, the, look through the women's exponent, look through the juvenile instructor, just looking for Eliza Arsenault poems. Uh, there was a new staff there in, in church excitement. Uh, those were the days when the archives had just opened. We could go back into the archives ourselves pull out whatever we wanted and look at it. It was it was an exciting time. And it opened a whole new world for me. Uh, I do have to say I, I can I can think of those early days sitting in uh, the, what was then the church historical department. We were located in the church office at uh, 50 East North Temple. We were in the East Wing on the second floor. Our group was known as the History Division and uh, I I didn't have any other obligations. I worked late into the night. I, I just was having the time of my life sitting at the the desk those first few months thinking, oh, it's just so it's just so quiet here. There aren't there aren't uh, 11 and 12 year olds around <laughs> being noisy. It's just so quiet here. But um, it was it was it was great. Maureen was a great mentor and uh, to to uh, beginnings and people I really looked up to. She was a wonderful, wonderful mentor and really writing some early articles on my own. Leonard Arrington as well. Very. It wasn't enough to do the research or the source checking. Uh, they got me on my way writing articles. Uh, Davis Bitten and Jim Allen reporters and, and mentors. And so even though I'd had a history minor in at the University of Utah, this was really my on-the-spot historical training, and I, nobody could have had more mentors. Uh, they critiqued my work. Uh, that was that was a new experience for me. I learned a lot from those critiques, and uh, just a lot of a lot of doing presentations. And interestingly enough, for your project, um, I had this little three-month fellowship, and then. They wanted to. They wanted me to stay on, and uh, the only job they had was that they got some oral history money from the James Moyle family. Then they set up the James Moyle Oral History Program. So that first full year, I was uh, 
Williams Memorial Oral History Program. And nothing could have been a, a greater blessing in my life because uh, Belle Spafford had just been released as general president of the Relief Society, and I was able to do 12 hours of oral history with her. And Laverne been in, it released as a longtime president of the primary, so I was able to do lots of hours of oral history with her, and I, I felt close to both of those women, uh, Laverne Parmley. I did some other oral interviews with uh, women who'd worked in the uh, especially uh, Bertha Reeder and uh, LaRue Longden, who'd been a counselor. Uh, counsel uh, LaRue Longden, I remember particularly fondly. She was a jolly woman. In fact, I got out her oral history the other day, day to look at something, and I just thought, oh, this was a wonderful opportunity. She, this was a wonderful uh, relationship. So I did much. I got to review those transcripts and <laughs> uh, learn something about those women. I didn't have to transcribe, but I did review transcripts. <laughs> that was a, an important beginning for me. Yes. Um, were there any other uh, experiences that stood out to you during that during that time, uh, any other, any other women or any other men that you wanted to mention that played a significant role during really that that start of your of what you have kind of been doing now for the last I don't know how many. Is there any other things you want to mention? Pat? Certainly. It was, a, it was a time of opening up and, and remarkable opportunities. No one could have been more blessed than I was. Uh, Maureen Ersenbach, later Beecher, was a was a, a terrific worker. She was so good at establishing networks. She loved doing that. And Leonard Arrington was a tremendous entrepreneur. He loved getting things started. Of those two, really made for uh, an extraordinary environment in the historical department, the history division of the historical department. Uh, Leonard had files on in, uh, women. His his own work on uh, Mormon women stretched back to the 1950s when he was working on Great Basin Kingdom, and he found out. Uh, stories about the economic activity of Mormon women, their cooperative stores and their work in Relief Society. So he, uh, their work in medicine, he had been putting together files for a long time, which he largely and to me. But Maureen had a, a vision of uh, engaging a lot of women in this work. She, uh, you know, you have, this was the this was the beginnings of the women's movement in the United States. And uh, there was a, a great interest in women's history. I, I mean, I still have in my files these early women's studies courses from women around the United States. We were all trying to find information about women's history. People were starting to study women in the American Revolution and women's studies Rarely being interest, er, introduced in universities. Uh, Maureen went to a Berkshire conference, this conference on the history of women known as the Berkshire Conference, and um, Massachusetts and met with women from around uh, the United States who were, it was all just these beginnings of women's history. So Maureen was, was terrific at saying, Let's, we, we know uh, young uh, wives and mothers who doing research, and she was really good at reaching out and finding people and saying, hey, would you be interested in on Jane Richards, and would you be interested in, in doing research on uh, Ellen Ferguson or, or Martha Hughes Cannon? We have these files. We can help support you in, in building. Maureen was, was great at that, and one of the women we worked with, Vicki Burgess Olson, uh, was also an entrepreneur, happy to work with those women in bringing their work to publication, and that's how that 
collection, Sister Saints, was uh, uh, brought into being published by BYU Press. The women who'd gone forward with their uh, study of Mormon women produced a book in 1976, and Maureen and I both uh, put articles in, in that book. I did the source checking for that book. There was a, a, a very nice uh, collaboration between those women and the the history department. As I say, Leonard was, if you look at the, the dedication in that book, it's to Leonard Arrington who took us seriously. Uh, there was this sense of, of uh, beginning, bringing things together. Who were interested in working on uh, Latter-day Saint women who came into this circle were uh, Valley, uh, Val Tippett's Avery and Linda King Newell. His work on Emma Smith became their biography, Mormon Enigma. Um, we had, uh, you know, we just pulled women together uh, when they were in town and then developed a little Wednesday group that met every Wednesday at the Lion House. Uh, that was Maureen Beecher and myself, uh, Levine, who was working for the Ensign at that time, Linda Newell, who was working on the Emma biography, uh, Melody Mitch Charles um, was also part of that group met for lunch every Wednesday at the Lion House. It didn't matter how big our group was, sometimes it was 10 people, but those uh, round tables, we just expanded it. The Wednesday lunch was our, our chance to really brainstorm and forward wi women's history. Uh, one of the things that came out of that was Sisters in Spirit, uh, a collection of uh, Maureen Beecher and Levina Fielding Anderson, and that was published uh, in 1987 by Illinois Press. So it was just, it was a time of just such uh, excitement and uh, moving forward. It was a, it was a thrilling place to be. Um, I left in, in uh, when we went to France. I actually stopped working full-time even before, after our son was born. So I was in and out, but a lot of women were in and out. Very few people had the luxury of full-time uh, careers, balancing home and family, so uh, it, was a, it was a very exciting time. So you mentioned kind of a transition of going from uh, when you came to, to Alpine and you kind of transitioned from what you thought you were, and if I'm understanding right, please correct me if I'm not, trying to go the teacher route and you found yourself going more of a research route. Um, what other transitions did you experience and maybe how they influenced you? One great thing during these years, uh, there were so few people doing uh, history work. So I, I had the opportunity to uh, teach a, a course at BYU in history uh, that uh, that was that was early early on. Uh, I don't remember this moment in time if that was before our son was born or after, but it was it was wonderful for me to go to a university and be in that environment, and in a in a in and out sort of way, I was able to maintain that. Uh, uh, I do have to say, <laughs> the first time I went to BYU. Uh, having been at, in graduate school at Harvard in these old rundown buildings the, uh, when I went to the Jesse time at BYU where I had never spent any time I just I, I really thought I was in the world's largest bathroom with all the tile on the walls I thought this is so clean and so tidy I just I just can't get to me so unlike a university <laughs> unlike the places I've been <laughs> That was funny, but I loved teaching at BYU, and I loved uh, the students there. And I've had to I've had to do a lot of transitions. You know, the uh, in 1980, the history division actually broke up in the historical department and moved to BYU and became the Smith Institute for Latter Day Saint History. And uh, but because I had just had our son, and uh, then. I was working on other things, but then in 85 we went to France. I was never part of that uh, move, really. Uh, I didn't, uh, didn't keep 
connection. But uh, when we came back from France, um, I have to say Ron Esplanier was very supportive. He was the director at that time. Helped me get office space, helped me work on some of the projects I was connected to the history of the Relief Society, which I'd already begun by that time. So uh, I, I reconnected at, at BYU. That transition was easy. I mean, it was all my same colleagues from the, uh, the history division. They made that very simple and very easy. That was, that was, uh, that worked out very well. But it was much harder to go to France and come home from France. Those were more difficult situations. Uh, being in a, in a foreign country, uh, having the kids in, in school, struggling with the language myself. Those were, those were great challenges. It was interesting. I was actually away um, the the time of the Hoffman forgeries and the Hoffman bombings and a lot of uh, scrutiny of of more at that time. I was actually removed from the picture, so I didn't feel some that my my colleagues did. Um, I think there was a lot around that that was very. Uh, difficult, but I was I was removed from that uh, at that particular moment in time. I did I loved being in French culture, and it was interesting after being in the United States and studying women's history, and going to France and being in a, um, uh, what would I, I I would would say. In, in a lot of ways, I would say a much more feminine culture, a, a love for the arts, um, and it, it wasn't, I, I think, very, very welcoming of, of women, very, uh, uh, I mean, a lot of part time in France, they were, they were wives and mothers at the same time that they were per pursuing things professionally. It didn't seem as polarized, I guess I would have to say. Women's, women's world didn't seem as polarized. I know, I mean, I know from studying there were uh, French feminists and uh, a movement that I probably, in the way I was encountering the culture, wasn't aware of. But I found it very friendly. Uh, in 89, we went to Switzerland. Uh, we were actually my husband had another teaching appointment this time at the um, International uh, Management Development in Lausanne. And uh, the Swiss culture, I thought, was a very harsh and masculine culture. Uh, I mean, women still worked part-time part uh, and had their families, but I thought the culture was, I thought the culture was much harsher in a way. So. Um, two interesting experiences. On the other hand, we were there long enough that uh, I was I was totally acclimated. My French was better. Things were easier with the, the children. Uh, loved the friends and neighbors, loved the people in the, the ward. Even took uh, courses, uh, courses at the University of Lausanne in French, because by then my French was good enough. But it was only good enough in religion, because that's where I mostly spoke it, so I took, I took because that vocabulary I didn't know, <laughs> but uh, both times I think it was it was almost hard home. Uh, but uh, while I was in Switzerland, I was working on the Relief Society history. Again, my friend Maureen Beecher was part of that. Janet Cannon was part of that, and you know things worked out. Things worked out to to make it happen. I had the kids writing time at home. Fax machines worked. Um, we didn't have the internet working quite as well, but we had we had the facts. And uh, interestingly enough, Janet and her husband Ted were called to be um, mission presidents at the Frankfurt Temple. So I was able to go to Frankfurt while I was in Switzerland and work history. I mean, things things worked out in in really wonderful ways. And uh, when I got back, I had uh, support again from the Smith Institute at BYU. Um, Finish that up. Uh, Ron Esplin was very supportive, and because he kept supporting us in that project, it, it really went through our uh, the Quorum of the Twelve Smith Institute advisors, who were very supportive of the project. So that longtime Relief Society history that started in 1980 and wasn't published till 1992 had a lot of institutional support. So 
difficult transitions, but um, both on the family end and the professional end, uh, were were supportive and and stepped in to help fill in the gaps. My next question being, what has it been like to balance career and family? Would you say that those around you, wherever you lived, always played a large role in helping you to do that? Absolutely. And do you have any comments? Abs absolutely. That? I think when my, when my son was very young, uh, my mother helped out uh, so I could work part-time. I also had a couple of neighbors who had uh, sons the same age, a toddler age, uh, who were helpful in in helping out with him. I would say maybe three half days a week. And I actually only I, I'm one of those fortunate people who was able to work part time. Uh, when you think when you think how old I am, I, I mean I, I was able to work part time until 2003. That that was the first moment in my life when I was working full time. And by then. Our children were grown, uh, but uh, working part time is wonderful. Uh, I've I've found it hard to work full, full time, very hard. If I'd had to do that, I think balancing would have. Been but working at BYU, having some flexibility with hours, that made things much easier. Uh, and my husband had a university appointment as well, so we had the benefit of flexible schedules, and that made a huge difference. It's all the difference in the, the world. I mean, now to put in, I, to do the kind of eight-hour day I do now uh, would be very hard. Uh, I could continue my writing when my husband's work took him elsewhere to France. Uh, that's been easy to say. Um, I would like to say, from my perspective, uh, when we talk about balancing, it's just almost impossible. It was really hard for me. It was in balance. I mean, I always felt like either my work wasn't getting done or the family was getting neglected. I always felt caught in between. I wish, I, I mean, in retrospect, I wish I would have been able to be more totally present in each of those parts of my life without worrying. Uh, when I was at work worrying about the family, when I was with the family worrying about the work that wasn't was maybe my own uh, particular curse, but uh, I uh, going to the old uh, grocery store in ZCMI downtown. Uh, so I don't know. I think I, I don't know when that would have been. Uh, because I'm sure I would have, have left the historical department, but I ran into Winifred Jardine, and I had known uh, Winifred Jardine's uh, sons, Jim and Steve, felt a, a kind of closeness to her. And she was, uh, as you might know, food editor of the Deseret News for many, many years. And so I just said, how my question was, how do, I never feel like I'm in balance. And she just looked at me and said, and you never will. You never will feel like you have these two things balanced. So um, I think that was a terrible thing to say to me. And yet I'm so grateful that she said that because now I haven't felt bad that um, it's, it's, it's been to, to do. But, uh, and the kids have been great. And my, my husband has been great. In fact, he's been very encouraging to me uh, to work at least part time. I would be an overly obsessive compulsive mother if I didn't have other interests and I'm sure he was absolutely right uh, so he was he was very encouraging I will tell one story this uh, <laughs> this should go this should go on on record this is sort of the ultimate this was probably in in 1980 or 19 I'm, I'm quite sure it was 1980 because I was uh, going to Mormon History Association in New York to give a paper, and that was the big centennial church celebration. And uh, I had I had all the, the kids at home, and one, and I was trying to finish my paper. I'm always chronically behind. And uh, everybody came down with the stomach flu, and I was trying to finish 
and clean up the stomach flu messes. And I, I'm sure I cleaned the carpet about four times. And then I finally got sick. And I just <laughs> remember I was I was amazed that that, that paper got in and and. <laughs> that year at a conference, um, so it's a, the ultimate of life being it just seems so impossibly out of balance. Yeah. Wow. Um, kind of shifting gears, maybe a little bit. Maybe this is a transition in itself. But like I wrote, I I counted forty five of your works. Uh, this is just a list that I had, including that included books and articles and reviews as well. And about a fourth of those had Eliza in the title. And I'm sure that a lot of others talked extensively about her. So why the fascination with Eliza Snow? And you kind of recounted some of that path, I guess, but why the fascination? I think that's it's because that's where I started with this little set of index cards, uh, keeping track of her her poetry, and who was who was working on a larger biography of Eliza R. Snow. So I I uh, initially started exploring some of her, some of her ideas about women, uh, and then when I did this work on the Relief Society history, I got into her life. For several years, uh, Maureen Ersenbeck Beecher and I were planning to collaborate on a biography of Eliza Arsenal. We were both uh, working on Eliza simultaneously. Her work on Eliza's personal writings, uh, Maureen's book, The Personal Writings of Eliza Arsenal, 1995, 96, something, something like that. When she finished that uh, book, I think she felt in a way that she she had finished her work on on Snow for a while, we thought we could come together and do a biography, um, but we had views of Eliza R. Snow, so we weren't sure how that was going to work out. And Maureen left the Smith Institute around ninety seven or ninety eight, I think, and uh, having decided that uh, if if that work was going to go forward, I would have to do it because. Uh, she was she was interested in other things. She was moving to Canada, and uh, that that part of her life came to an end. So I was more serious about that at uh, that time, and that's when uh, Karen Lynn Davidson came aboard to help me finish up the poetry. We'd kind of been up and down about whether or not the poetry book should go forward, but Karen Lynn Davidson came aboard, and nobody. Could better colleague to work with. That was a huge project and Karen was just amazing in terms of being able to put everything in order, her own insights from literature to to that and uh, I kind of work on Eliza going with some of the articles I did to explore some other parts of her her life and so that's been an ongoing interest of mine. I'm still trying to figure out how to finish the biography. Uh, I've talked with other Writing and uh, still, I've 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 got a, a lot outlined, some some written, uh, and it's a, a to, to finish, but uh, it's yet to be finished. <laughs> when is did you have a kind of goal for yourself as far as? Uh, well, there are some other projects. I mean, the getting uh, getting. A book on Relief Society documents done in which she plays a, a major role have had to come first, but uh, it's it's it will emerge someday after uh, this mission uh, that we're leaving on in January, but uh, it will it will come forth. But yes, it it is a it is a interest. Yeah, and as you as you began to research her and as you've researched her throughout your life, what attributes or characteristics would you pin on Eliza R. Snow that, that you admire yourself? I'm still discovering, I have to say. Uh, I think she, she is a, 
I, I think her, her gifts of spirit, her, her capacity, I think open herself up to to revelation and acknowledge that uh, as revelation uh, in that I, I think are a good instance of that probably my, oh my father being the most outstanding example I think uh, being so definitive with women about uh, opening revelation receiving the gift of the Holy Ghost uh, for guidance and for inspiration, that that certainly has to be the the key characteristic. I, one of the things about Eliza Snow is her capacity to a, a situation and find her space within it. She she has a. I mean, I guess maybe if you were looking at it this way you could say give her an inch and she takes a mile but uh, I think she she was very gifted at uh, taking responsibility or a possibility and really so I can I can see this at certain critical moments in her life uh, she she loved her poetry as a young person I mean she she publishes her first poem uh, these newspapers need poetry. She finds a way to make her presence felt even as a young woman. She's she's publishing. She seems to feel like she has to give some of that up when she joins the church. As she initially writes a couple of hymns. There's this period of silence we kind of don't know what to do with. She doesn't really talk about it. We don't we really don't know all the reasons why. I mean maybe she saw people like Parley P. Pratt publishing and following something that she would do but she, she seems to have some kind of conversation with Joseph Smith about using her poetic talents uh, for the church and once she decides she's going to do that she just her life is just different so uh, coming off all those Missouri persecutions she's with her family but she stops in Quincy her parents and her brothers go on but she and her sister stop and she says says the reason she stops is so that she can write for the press. And this this becomes a big thing. I mean, she she is publishing a lot of poems, a lot of them defending Mormonism, expressing other ideas. She just, I just think of that two weeks in Quincy or three weeks in Quincy, she just, she just does so much with that. And it changes her life. She just jumps in and, and um, I think that's true in Nauvoo. You you see that with the Relief Society. She's not just going to take these meetings. These you know these Relief Society minutes that she takes as secretary of the Female Relief Society of Nauvoo is just an hour. These are as this is as good a, a record of Joseph Smith's sermons as we have from any of his clerks. Um, she, he tells the sisters that their record is going to be in law. And she keeps a beautiful record, and then she preserves it. I mean, she carries, and she uses it in Utah when she's called upon. I mean, it's partly that record that results in her being called upon to help reestablish Relief Society. Um, same thing with the town called to be over uh, women's ordinance work in the endowment house in in 1855, and she works at that until 1885 or 86. I mean, she is a, a constant uh, in women's rituals in the endowment house. And when you, th I, when Emmeline Wells says thousands of women have been blessed under her hands, and that must have been true when you think of all the women she went to school in the ordinance known as the endowment and uh, the, the other preliminary ordinances. She she had contact, tactile contact with with women, blessing them, and I think using that opportunity to to uh, not only perform the rituals but bless them individually. Uh, she used that in wonderful ways, so that by 1868, when she's called to work uh, in reestablishing Relief Society, she knows women and. 
she uses the the language of the temple in trying to uh, empower them spiritually, trying to and then in her work as Relief Society president, it's the same way. It's this leveraging. It's it's just immediately jumping in and uh, sensing what needs to be done and really jumping on every. The other thing you have to say about her is um, she had a profound sense of order. She believed in order. I, I she's a very orderly person. I don't. I I think that shows in her writing. All of this. Work working within certain uh, rhyme and metrical schemes. Uh, she has a sense of order. Also uh, larger, it, it has to do with the order of government. Uh, she's a child of the American Revolution. You think she's, she's born, what, 16 or 17 the American Constitution is written. She grows up in the New Republic, and, and they're concerned with order freedom. And I would say, uh, you know, she has a great sense of individual rights, of how things should be ordered. So these Relief Society minutes, his constitution and law, very important to her. But uh, part of what brought her to Mormonism, was not it was these gifts of the Spirit, gifts, prophesying, speaking in tongues, healing, these gifts are very important to her, but the order and organization. And she is a person who had a importance of working within the order. So in a way, she was just the ideal leader for that moment in time because I think she could help women negotiate what it meant to come into the church and take responsibility. I mean, for Latter-day Saint women today, this is easy because the rules are all written and uh, maybe that's frustrating, but it's also easy. We know what to expect. We know that a Relief Society president will work uh, in connection with or under the direction of a bishop. That was, they did not know how to do that. And she was, she was a coach in schooling people how to negotiate their way through some difficult circumstances. And I, when I say negotiate their way, that's because they weren't sitting around waiting for people to tell them what to do and then they hopped to. No, they initially advantage of every opening and the negotiating for them was knowing when not too far in a way that would close off opportunities for them and she was she was just brilliant at that she was just brilliant at giving women a sense of power and uh, action they are agents and at the same time understand that there are certain limits within which they should work so she had an uncanny sense of both possibilities and limitations, and uh, she she was brilliant at that. And the women around her knew she was brilliant. I mean, she was a she was a great uh, leader and seen as the president of all the women's organizations. She just she just played a singular role in nineteenth century Mormonism. How have they impacted you in your life specifically? Any of those characteristics? <laughs> I, th I think studying women's history generally has had a, a tremendous impact. I think it's given me, because it's given me knowledge, I, I think it's opened up a whole, whole world of role models. Uh, I, I have so many role models. Uh, I don't confined by any stereotypes. I mean, from the time I was, was 24, 25, I've been exposed to a variety of kinds of women's lives. I think combined with what I said earlier about my family's own emphasis on choice, I have just never felt uh, because uh, it seemed to me I, I knew so many options. I knew, I, you know, I knew about Bathsheba Smith and her homemaking skills, and I I knew about uh, somebody like Annie Clark Tanner and her intellectual aspiration. I knew about an Eliza and her, her leadership. So I think that broad variety had a great impact on me. Eliza specifically, yes. I think I think the the uh, commitment to cultivating the gifts of the spirit. 
uh, not not that I do that all the time, <laughs> but I I think uh, they giving me given me an understanding of those possibilities, the importance of the temple, certainly the power that comes through those temple ceremonies. Uh, uh, she spoke about that that has given me a, a new set of questions to ask when I'm engaged in those rituals. Uh, and, and certainly the way to operate within an institution. Uh, because I've studied her so much, I internalized a lot of that. Uh, there are things that I wouldn't, I wouldn't expect, and I have, I have been fortunate to work for a long time within the the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints as an institution. I think, I, th I think she has been a, a splendid guide. I think there are things that don't take me by uh, surprise that might take other people by surprise, or there are ways that I'm I'm willing to be a little more temperate. Than some people might have been, uh, because I see that in that temperance is a key to influence and a certain kind of authority. So yes, I think those those have been things I've learned from her definitely. How would you put all of that into like, I guess, a maxim? Do you have like a that's kind of, kind of guided your life, or is that basically it? <laughs> uh, I don't. I. I. My. My life is guided by uh, a motto. I. I think uh, one thing I identify with in is from the time she was very young. She wanted to. To make a contribution, and I can really, I, I think I've, I've wanted to make a contribution, and I would have to say this about women's history that it, it has been so big and so meaningful to me, um, and I, I don't want another dear colleague, which is Carol Cornwall Manson, with whom I worked in the history division and also at Smith Institute. I feel uh, feel the largeness of history in our lives. It's been a it's been a great uh, path to self discovery, and uh, I think one of the things that's done is that uh, when I say I want to make a, a contribution, it is so much larger than I personally do. It is it is so it is so much bigger to to uh, tell the history, to put women in touch with their lives and their their faith, the in their faith. That uh, and I think Eliza would have felt this way. When you're when you're committed to a cause that is bigger and you want to contribute to that cause, your own own uh, part in that comes to seem so small and insignificant and that that should be that uh, the, I think the legacy Eliza left is so much bigger than the individual Eliza. The legacy has impacted so many lives in different ways for many generations. And, uh, and I think in some ways the con her individual contribution is obscured because of the, of all the lives that she impacted, that she empowered, uh, all of the ways she institutionalized some things that were important. And I, I guess if I had to say something, it would be uh, something much bigger than yourself. You know, find, find that uh, to which you want to dedicate your life, understanding that Many people will be part of that cause, and you can be grateful for playing some small role in something much that will will bless many lives. Um, I I think as I get, I can see that more than ever because uh, uh, you can't I don't think you can you can't hold on 
to um, the aspect of these things. Um, the the projects that I've started will will go on without me, and a certain tenderness about that. But there's great excitement about that to see people. I mean, to see a, a younger generation like yourself and that um, this work goes on, and I I feel that way about uh, my 19th century women and the 20th century come to know as well. Uh, I mean, it just seems like uh, all the things you've asked about uh, meaningful work, how we can, um, how we how we interact with each other and somehow leave the world a better better place. Uh, I've been fortunate to have those things come together in the, the history that has been such a big part of my life. I'm so sorry I neglected to include in that question a favorite scripture that's, you know, or just a scripture that has aided you in a particularly difficult moment. Uh, well, the thing that comes uh, most immediately to mind uh, both have to do with, with learning. Uh, one, uh, in, in Ether, I, I think it's the 12th chapter of Ether in the Book of Mormon that uh, says, if men come unto me, I will weakness, and I give unto men weakness, that they may be humble, and my grace is sufficient. If they humble themselves before me and have faith in me, then weak things will become strong unto them. And uh, because I didn't get a PhD, um, I've often felt the weakness of that. <laughs> And uh, yet, I've had uh, the most remarkable mentors and remarkable uh, opportunities to, uh, and some of those weaknesses have become strengths. And when, where they haven't been strengths, um, there have been people there to fill in the gaps. And I'm, I'm really grateful for that. Uh, I've always felt like I was part. A community, a team working together, as I said from the very beginning in the historical department, and somehow that that group of people has has uh, been able to contribute something much bigger than any of us individually. I think a second uh, scripture is from the Doctrine and Covenants in section ninety three, where we talk uh, we're, we're told about um, revelation given to. Uh, John the Beloved, that that uh, the Savior Jesus Christ was able to grow grace from grace to grace, and uh, I've always wanted to do that in my life. Uh, grow little by little, make uh, choices, and gain the love that allow me to be uh, a fuller and better person. And I'm still working on it. <laughs> well, those are a couple of, of favorites. Thank you so much. Uh, you mentioned weaknesses, um, maybe going off of that, a significant trial, what would you name as your most significant trial in your life? I, th I, I think, uh, I think probably the most significant trials have have been connected with our our family um, and the around uh, a divorce which is devastating in any family um, and those are things that I would not want to talk to except to acknowledge them that uh, there are, you know, there are, are deep wounds uh, for children of divorce, and and those who have, have lived with us in our family for a long time, and yet I think they've they've uh, deepened, uh, deepened my husband and our children 
and uh, made us more understanding and compassionate. Uh, I think the the other uh, trial is is um, I don't know that it's really a trial, but I think challenges introduced by the history understand uh, the ways in which the past is different from the present and understanding how the past takes things in a different direction and uh, at the same time introduce two possibilities. So I think uh, I think knowing knowing what happened in the and knowing I think sometimes the uh, empowerment, the ways that women in the 19th century felt empowered, uh, sensing that there might be some disparity between their sense of and the way that women feel uh, today. Uh, um, trying to bridge that for myself and for others, I think, has been a challenge uh, because we like to we we like to feel as that that everything is is just right and and could be and uh, yet I think sometimes there are answers in the past to our current. So that that has been a trial more at at some moments than I think uh, when I was young and working in the history division, um, we had some passes for a general conference that we passed around in the division. We could go to different sessions, and I got a pass uh, and went to the tabernacle to go to a. Um, a session of conference, a general session of conference, and this is just this is early in the 1970s when I was just starting. And the usher said to me, "Lady, this is a priesthood pass. You're in the wrong church." <laughs> <laughs> I I remember my own consciousness about women's issues was just barely uh, starting to be formed at that time, and I. I really sort of stormed off and thought maybe I church um, the the narrowness of his uh, approach, and I think um, I've encountered that narrowness on other occasions. I'm more compassionate now, but uh, that was a that that was an interesting difficulty. <laughs> <laughs> what would you like to be remembered for? Uh, Be remembered. For, I would. I guess I would like to be remembered for uh, doing my part in pushing the what I believe is the kingdom of God forward in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter Day Saints. Both as a a member with my family and as a historian who who uh, told stories that helped uh, cement people together and, and push forward the establishment of Zion. Thank you. And what advice do you have for younger women? In uh, advice. I think my advice would, would come out of what I've learned from Eliza that uh, we need to look at the the possibilities that are there and maximize them, maximize them in ways that that magnify our own talents and at the same time make a to lives around us, whether that's in our home uh, or in our our church community or community. I think by by seizing those possibilities and magnifying them, we we grow personally, and we make unique contributions. And I think I think individuals have unique contributions to make. I think we have to recognize that um, we we have all those models out there, but uh, nobody follows anyone else's model. 
look at the possibilities in our own lives and, and maximize them in ways that, that will be our unique uh, contribution. Thank you. Thank you so much. Is there anything that, that you would like to add? <coughs> I know our time is short, but let me just ask a couple of detail things that we could get even in an email. But Jill, what, what year were you born? I, I was born September 8th, 1948. Okay. And when you when you did the History of Relief Society, was that an assignment given to you? That evolved within the history department. Uh, in in 19 the there was some consideration at church headquarters about to handle uh, the work of the history division. Leonard Arrington had been given the assignment to pull together that research and write history. And uh, there were some questions raised about the history being written at the history division as Story of the Latter-day Saints and uh, by, by uh, Jim Allen and Glenn Leonard and building the in May. So there were some tensions uh, as we moved from a period of totally faithful devotional history to more scholarly history. Questions were raised. The twelve in the first presidency discussed what, how that, how that academic, we sort of scholar might go forward, and uh, they decided to move into uh, BYU. And at that time, uh, G. Homer Durham was the, uh, I think he would have been called the executive. Of the history division, so uh, Leonard Arrington was actually working under his direction, and he was he was this change, and he felt that there were some things that would best be done uh, outside institutional setting that they might best be done by individual historians, and he felt like the history of the relief of those things he had he had talked with. Uh, Barbara Smith and other uh, the possibility of a, a Relief Society history. So he called me in uh, along with Jim Cannon, who had been Sister Smith's counselor in the Relief Society presidency, and asked if we if we wouldn't move forward on that his on that history on a contract basis with Deseret Book. So we set up a, a contract with Deseret Book, and we were we were working independently on that history, still uh, in connection with the Relief Society, understanding we'd be in close with them, uh, but not as full time church employees. Mm -hmm. And Deseret Book often said that was a contract they had on their <laughs> their list. I think there were a couple of others, but. Twelve years was a long time, but we did, we did finish it. But in the end, not without institutional help. Uh, the the work of uh, uh, I, uh, before we went to uh, Switzerland in in eighty nine, I asked uh, Maureen Beecher to assist, and um, so the Smith Institute ended up with institutional help to to finish up that project. Okay, good. And the, the hours, the 12 hours that you did at Bell Stafford, where, where are those located? Uh, those oral histories are in the library now. Okay, and are they accessible? They the are. Regular? Mm -hmm. Okay, great. What other questions? The, all these questions arose as you were talking. What would you like to, um, what are your hopes and dreams, aspirations? And you finish some large, large projects. What's your <laughs> biggest aspiration besides the mission? Uh, well, I think the the final, including work I would like to do in in history is the Eliza. Uh, I'm a person who who loves to integrate things, and uh, hers is a complex life. It's not a story easily told. I have I have the pieces, and I know how to put them uh, together. So I do I do aspire to finish that uh, we'll be leaving in the Europe area in, in January of 2012, and that will take 18 months. Uh, I have scanned my files, and I'm taking them with me, hoping to 
minutes a day or something. Uh, I don't expect that it will be finished by the time I return, but uh, I am looking forward to thinking uh, just about that and focusing on that. Beyond that, I, I haven't uh, really looked. I, I guess I see myself doing some volunteer work in connection with the church history life. I also, uh, you know, there's that part of me that uh, wanted to teach in the ghetto school in Boston and and did, and I, I think I would like to go back to community action. I've, I've thought of uh, teaching women's history at the prison or uh, working uh, with the something a little more, a, a little less academically oriented uh, that would, would fill that other need in me. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Wow, oh. just a delightful interview to listen to. And learn from Carmen's friend.